Welcome to the Daily Brief for Carbon Removals at COP28. We're here every day of the conference with a different expert in the carbon removal world to tell you a bit about their perspective on carbon removals and the COP process while we're here. Um, so today we're here with Bila Durangu. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Why don't we start with just quick bio, background on yourself. Um, you know, who are you? How did you get to working in CDR? So it's a long question. How long do we have? Uh, but, <laughs> but yeah, thanks for having me. So my name is Bill Handy Rango. I am Kenyan, but I've done several things across uh, in the span of my career. But a lot of it all focused on Africa. And there's a reason I'm saying that. So um, engineer by training, um, spent a couple of years in development consulting and then left to co-found a tech company, a fintech, a fintech and communications company. I've done some stuff in education and youth development. And the reason all that's important into why I'm in the CDR space is um, in many ways, I came into the CDR space both from we need to decarbonize the world. So there is a big challenge that is climate change. But we also need to create employment for our young people in Africa. Um, as you might know, Africa is the youngest continent and only getting younger. And there's always this question around what's the thing that we do? What are the industries that we build that will actually create that employment. Um, it turns out there's not that many just because of where the world is at. But for an interesting set of reasons, um, in Africa, and in particular East Africa, which is where I'm from, um, happens to be a really amazing place for carbon dioxide removals. A lot of the factors that we need for CDR to happen, such as renewable energy mineralization, happen to be there. And so the more we thought about the opportunities that this presents, the more this became, well, this could be really interesting. We can actually build a CDR industry in Kenya while solving the unemployment problem. And so you get this amazing uh, piece of solution where you're solving two really big challenges in one way. So you're deca helping decarbonize the world while creating economic livelihoods for Africans. Great. Yeah. So yeah. tell us, I mean, more specifically what you're working on now at uh, Great Carbon Valley. Sure. So... Great Carbon Valley, as the name is, uh, it's almost a play on the Great Shift Valley. Um, and uh, we're a systems integrator slash project developer. And what we're looking to do is, again, take um, the factors that I talked about, which is the significant amounts of renewable energy, ability for us to store carbon underground because of the basaltic formations in the Rift Valley, and, uh, and say, okay, well, how, how do we put together, how do we develop sites that allow us to do both direct air capture, but other CDR technologies that could take advantage of this renewable energy. And so what, uh, what GCV is doing is actually identifying the sites. So when you say identify sites, um, it's identifying suitable sites that have geothermal potential and basaltic formations. So what that allows us to do is have the power and geothermal, which gives us both uh, power and steam and uh, carbon mineralization. So we can actually store carbon. And so we're identifying the sites, building them out, and then working with tech companies or dark companies um, to provide them with the infrastructure they need to then come up and set up um, in our sites. So ideally they would come in and we'll be able to give them both the power and storage and then our, the other ancillary services such as permitting and whatever else is needed for that to happen in Kenya. Yeah, and I think, I mean, obviously you guys are doing great work. I know mm -hmm. there's quite a few uh, DAC and sort of carbon removal startups out of mm -hmm. Kenya, which is really exciting to see. Yeah. Um, I'm curious to hear more about like the policy environment as well and how that's developing, because obviously in the carbon removal world, mm -hmm. you know, driving it with policy is a really important part of what needs to happen. No, for sure. Um, so it's really nascent. I mean, carbon removal is globally is nascent. Yeah. So you can imagine just how much more nascent it is in our part of the world. Um, but two things. One, um, lots of encouraging um, messaging from the top. So the president has been at the forefront. You probably had him here in the COP. Um, it's one of the COP sessions, but on the global stage, he's really been vocal around making Kenya um, a carbon removal hub. And the understanding that this could actually be a really interesting way to begin to attract foreign investments into the country and begin to provide um, FDI, as it were, um, as, we're, as, we're, as we're building more and more um, carbon removal projects. So lots of support at that level. Um, of course, there's conversations around how does the permitting work? How does, uh, what kind of policies are needed? And so just this morning, I had an interesting meeting with the Ministry of Environment discussing this very issue. And so there's regulations that are currently being developed. Um, some of them are still in some stages of development, um, but at least the messaging coming from them is we're here to support carbon removal as an industry, but at the same time, it has to be balanced with, it has to be high quality removals. We have to make sure that um, communities benefit. So there has to be that right balance, which is how do you make sure that 
you're getting, you know, you're getting the, you know, you're creating an environment that's enabling for investments to happen. But at the same time, communities, especially for community-based projects, um, these, you know, they're actually benefiting from this, um, from the projects that are being built around them. So I think that lots of dialogue that's happening. But what, what the reason I'm encouraged that is it's it's welcoming dialogue and it's conversations and how do we get the right level of compliance that finds the right balance between encouraging investments and ensuring this community benefits to the things that are being done. Yeah, and yeah. do you have things that you can kind of keep in mind to make sure that these community benefits happen, like best practices or, you know, things that you look out for? I think it's a combination. I, I think, sorry, I think it's a bit of a, it depends on the actual project. Um, so a bit removed from what we're currently doing, but I think still important to talk about is when you're dealing with more community-based projects. What I mean by that is nature-based stuff that's probably using forests or using conservancies or land, you know, own, land owned by communities. Then it is important that the community is aware around what is a project, what's you know, what what, what does it actually take, um, what kinds of monies are we looking at, etc., and what's the process. Uh, so I think that's that's important. Um, but then on the flip side, when you're dealing with more um, private sector led type work, which is something like a dark unit, a dark plant, etc., that may not necessarily have very deep community involvement, but then potentially has a lot of you know, um, impact on the community from a um, job creation perspective, energy access perspective. And so I don't think one size fits all. I think it's looking at each project and saying, by the time we're done, how does this benefit the coast country? So part of why GCV exists and why uh, we're really keen to build the projects we're building is because we recognize that we will have an, I mean, this gives us an, a, so stepping back a little bit, Africa has, or Kenya has a lot of um, significant, has a lot of renewable energy resources. We are not necessarily taking advantage of them, partly because there's no investment, there's no offtake for this project. So a lot of them just remain latent. Yes, it's there, but no one's asking, no one's going to be, no, one, no one's developing them. We, we, the part of the reason why dark is really interesting is because here's an energy intensive process that could use the significant amounts of energy that we uh, we have, and what we're hoping is by creating this late, this demand, uh, we'll encourage investments into energy, and then we'll actually have a lot more renewable energy coming into the grid, and hopefully that has a macro you know benefit for increasing energy access, reducing energy pricing, and um, a few other things around that. The industrialization that can happen around that, the jobs that will be created, and that's both direct jobs and indirect jobs. Um, the sites we are looking to develop dark tend to be fairly remote, which ideally is great because it then allows for indirect jobs to begin to happen and, you know, uh, interesting um, industries or, or um, service industries, you know, to happen around these places. And so in my mind, the way I look at it is this has a benefit of not just providing foreign direct investments, but you can create a lot of interesting jobs, not just directly in that, but just indirectly and ends up being hopefully being a win-win situation for everyone. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I think, you know, you mentioned how Kenya has this massive renewable mm -hmm. uh, resource and, you know, geothermal storage, mm -hmm. a workforce of young people, all of the stuff that mm -hmm. lends itself to sort of delivering carbon removal or delivering DAC. Um, at the same time, I think a lot of people, you know, make much of the fact that Kenya is not the one that put a lot of the emissions in yeah. our air there today. So mm -hmm. where do you see the different countries kind of fitting together in their roles for carbon removal and kind of where Kenya particularly fits into all of that? But it's an interesting one because people always say the global north put out the carbon, they should be responsible for it. Um, I look at it in two ways. One, that's already happened, but we're all suffering. Yeah. So carbon is carbon, unfortunately, and we all have the same levels of carbon in the atmosphere, regardless of where you are. And instead of apportioning the blame and saying, you did this, so you're responsible for it, I think it needs to be collectively, what can be done? Um, because at the end of the day, we're in it together. If we don't solve this problem as a, you know, as a world, we're, we're, we're all... Um, facing imminent issues as it were so i think it so that's one thing but secondly um if there's going to be investments that are going to be done in the carbon removal industry the question is what, what are the what are the right places to put to have these investments done and secondly um africa should be placing herself or should be kind of outing herself and saying you know what we are best place to actually provide solutions to this can we get paid for it yeah and i think that's when you look at it from that perspective where it's investments and you you're actually making money out of it and i say money it's, it's people don't like sometimes to think about that but it's important um, we're creating jobs out of it we are getting industries built around this the money is going to be spent somewhere um i mean i've read estimates that say it's this is going to be a trillion dollar industry by 2030 
So money is going to go into carbon removals. Um, all we're saying is, where, where are the best places to do carbon removals? Africa happens to be one of those places, and especially East Africa. So in my, I, I see it more by win-win situation, which is creating jobs while helping decarbonize the world, rather than saying, oh, we're not part of the problem and we're not going to be part of the solution. Um, I think that's actually shooting ourselves in the foot. Yeah, I think yeah. that's a great way to think about it. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, thinking about kind of solutions, we're here at COP. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, there's a negotiation process also yes. going on. Are you hopeful about it? Are you pessimistic? A little bit of both. Um, yeah, how are you feeling about the process? I think a little bit of both. Um, of course, these things never move as quickly as one would hope they do. Um, but one, I think, um, but on the flip side, I mean, it does help that there's dialogue and we're making sure that everyone's voice is being heard, which is there, it, there's, there's some value to that. Um, so one thing I think, of course, carbon removals haven't been a big part of the COP process. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting to even begin to have some level of conversation that's happening on, um, as far as carbon removals is concerned. I'm comparing this to last year uh, where there's a lot more sessions, there's a lot more conversations happening on carbon removals, which is a big plus. Um, starting to see a little bit of more conversations about carbon removals and the Global South, which again is even newer than yeah. just carbon removals at COP. So my sense is that this is hopefully the beginning and this forms the, you know, at least some basis for some conversation to happen. Um, and of course, it's not nowhere near enough. Um, both from what's the level of the conversation that's happening, what's the level of financing, how much of that is going to the global south. And I think starting to have these different dialogues happening, I'm a bit hopeful, but could, could, could happen a lot faster. Um, I mean, of course, it'd be interesting to see any, what progress is made as far as Article 6 is concerned, um, because we talk about CDR, of course, there's a question about voluntary markets versus compliance markets. Uh, we're grateful for the voluntary markets, but we recognize that the real play is really going to be um, at the point at which countries can trade uh, in the comp compliance markets. Um, and especially for Africa, I think that's going to be a really important turning point. Again, I think that could be moving a lot faster than it currently is. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, and just before I let you go, um, you know, all of our, our audience are people in the carbon removal space. Mm -hmm. uh, anything exciting or interesting you'd point them to? Panels coming up at COP, announcements coming from GCV, anything at all? Um, sure. Thinking about, oh, we've already done a whole bunch of panels. If sure. you know, that happened before this. Um, later today, I'm going to be speaking at the Finland, in the Finland Pavilion. And it's this, real, this question around policy around CDR and especially CDR in the global not in the global south. Okay. So that should be particularly interesting. Um, hopefully people can tune in. Um, and it, for me, I think it's really interesting having a European country then, you know, um, hosting this and having players both in the, from the global north and global south talking about CDR. I think that's quite important. Um, looking forward to having some conversations with mineralization companies um, that are looking to come to Kenya. So again, uh, we'll probably be making some announcements around that once that's signed. But either way, I think um, at DCV, we'll continue. for us, COP is one more step in a long journey. Um, I think we're just at the beginning of carbon dioxide removals, much more so uh, carbon dioxide removals in East Africa. And what we're hoping to do is the more people begin to see the role that Africa can play and should be playing as far as CDR is concerned, hopefully this becomes a way for us to as well, are thinking about where else can I do CDR? Um, can we make sure that Africa is part of that conversation? And not just from a victim perspective, but from a really investable opportunities. And probably, it would even be faster to do some of these things in Africa than it may be in some of these other markets. So my hope is that this just becomes one, one more step in moving the CDR conversation forward and more so the CDR conversation in Africa. Great. Um, yeah. Bill, thanks so much for joining us. Um, for everyone watching, thanks again for being here. And do come back tomorrow for the next one. Check out carbonremovals.org for the, all the other great stuff that we have there.